let's begin. Um, today's, uh, today's topic with bottom line technologies is treasury security. And there's a focus on the interior, the inside part of the organization. What are we, uh, what are we seeing and what are we doing in this space? So uh, to frame that, I wanted to welcome uh, David Levine and uh, David Allen. So welcome, uh, welcome David. Maybe you can just do a quick overview of your role at Bottom Line. Uh, thanks very much, Craig. Um, my role is Director of Product Marketing um, with a specific focus around our financial messaging, which includes our SWIFT service bureaus and our cloud-based cash management and payment solutions. Great. Thank you, Craig. Uh, my responsibility is, at Bottom Line Technologies is focused on our cyber fraud and risk management business. I wanted to start off uh, providing some context for, uh, you know, for some of the issues related to security. Bottom Line uh, underwrote a significant Treasury fraud and control survey that we ran earlier in the year, and you've probably seen that. Some of that information is available online, both the infographic and details. But there's some very interesting trends that came out of that. You'll want that for uh, later on to, to use and to look at and see what people are doing, what the trends are, um, how people are responding to items. But I wanted to touch a couple things on the left-hand side of the screen, and then um, I'll turn it over to, uh, uh, you know, to Dave to talk a little bit about some of the macro trends. But on the left-hand side, the, the theory here is that based on what's happened, crime does pay. Now, we're not saying that you should go out and commit crime, but the economics of crime have, have changed dramatically. You know, check fraud is oftentimes in the $1,300 to $1,700 loss, per instance. It tends to be smaller, and that's a significant number. You have to put defenses in place. That's been around for a long time. You know, $1,500 is, is typically where it is. When we look at business email compromise or imposter fraud, where people are getting organizations to send out payments on their own, right? They're, they're uh, managing uh, people, getting them to think that it's valid to send out payments uh, based upon some FBI data. The number of instances and the total losses, that's, that's averaging in the $130,000 per instance range. And some of the data we have on that is, you know, 77% of firms have had at least one attack or attempt in the last two years, and over 10% of those have actually suffered uh, a loss on that. So it's, it's a significant number, it's, it's significant dollars. When we look at, when we look at that coupled with, uh, coupled with system fraud, uh, you know, where it might be a combination of the social engineering and actually getting into systems, that number multiplies again by like another order of magnitude. Um, and so this would be like Bangladesh, the central bank, where their system was compromised, they came in through the firewalls, uh, uh, codes and uh, other information that was able to be sent out through their payment systems was compromised and they actually ended up losing uh, 101 million dollars was sent out uh, almost a billion dollars was attempted 20 million dollars was returned because the criminals did not know how to spell foundation they spelled it foundation that triggered some some questions and that money was returned but they lost 81 million dollars so when you look at the scale of crime does pay check fraud think of fifteen hundred dollars scale it up two orders of magnitude, about $150,000 for business email compromise. When you get into system fraud, think of it as another one or two additional orders of magnitude about the size of that. And so these are bringing out more than just low-level criminals. These are bringing out fraud rings, possibly state actors that are looking to you know, perform that cashectomy of pulling all this money out of the organization. So this idea of crime does pay means a response is needed on many fronts. And part of that, you know, what do we do on the interior? What do we do with our employees? Uh, what is our banking structure? There's a number of ranges of defense that we need to put in place to make sure that we make it more expensive to handle this type of scenario. And so those are, those are some of the elements in terms of why crime does pay, how significant it is. And I wanted to maybe just as, uh, at this point to talk about some of the other macro trends, David, Alan. So uh, you know, some of the macro trends that we're seeing and you're seeing in the space, since that's where you live, what are you seeing at the, at the broad level? Uh, on, on terms of cyber crime. Sure, thanks Craig. So, as you mentioned, there are a number of macro trends that, that cross industry. Um, the first is when I talk to treasury executive, treasury teams, what they care about most, what matters most to them is secure payments. So if you take a look at the context of what's happening, um, look at the banking industry for instance. Uh, more and more uh, customers, whether they're commercial or consumer customers of the banks, are turning towards what we call digital banking, online banking, for the convenience and for other factors. 
So with more and more transactions being done in these digital channels, no surprise, it's going to give rise to greater risk and unfortunately greater security breaches and, and fraudulent activity. The criminals are going to go where, where the transactions live. So that's, that's number one. And even deeper, if you look again in the banking industry as one example, there's also a, a shortened amount of time customers want their payments processed more quickly. So you look at same day ACH, you look at wire payments initiated and, and the customers requesting that they are approved in the same day. It puts enormous pressure on banks and if you look at other corporate entities, enormous pressure on these organizations to have systems in place that can analyze this activity and quickly determine is it, is it fine or is it fraudulent and to take quick action associated with that. So it puts a lot of pressure on these organizations and the risk is higher but the customers are demanding it. So it's this confluence of issues that are trending to, to drive this type of activity. Yeah, that's interesting, that idea of uh, we have to operate more quickly, um, so faster payments also pr creates that situation of one of the elements of fraud is how long it takes for payments to settle. There's a longer period of time to catch it. That has to be shortened up to match that, and that's an excellent point. Um, so let's, let's shift over to uh, David. Um, you know, employees, current and former employees were identified in a significant number of fraud issues that organizations had in that survey. I'd love, love if you just comment on um, not only the employee end of things, but also what is the treasurer's role in security, right? It's not just raising funds, but there is a, there is a asset protection uh, element to that too. I'd love, to, I'd love for you to talk about that. Yeah, Craig, thanks very much. And I think that you've hit on a really important point. A lot of people think about security, and the first thing they think about is the, the um, chief security information officer, or the chief security officer. And what I firmly believe, and what's really important is, that Treasury is responsible for the financial health of the organization. To a large extent, ultimately, the bottom line goes to the Treasurer. So he has to be, or she has to be involved in understanding the risk and understanding the, mitig the, the possible mitigating things that they can do. Obviously, working with the chief security officer, but ultimately the buck stops at the treasurer's dinner. And when you look at that, what it means is that all of the functions associated with the feed to treasury, payment certainly being part of it, and it's in the United States as opposed to many other countries, 55% of business to business payments are still on check. Three years ago, the FBI estimated, and it probably hasn't changed much, that 91% of fraud attempts were against checks. So as organizations have stalled, and we still look at a 55% figure of checks as business to business payment, that means that the risk is going to be there. Now on top of that, the other 45% that's electronic payments, all of the issues that Dave Allen talked about and that you mentioned in terms of being able to control the flow of information when time is becoming of the essence. You can't withdraw a wire. If it's fraudulent, it's still going to go through. And that means the internal operation, the internal visibility is critical. The goal is to stop the attempt before, to stop the issue before the actual fraud attempt is made. To understand behavior that could generate itself into an apparent fraudulent behavior. We saw that with one of the largest um, frauds in the last six months where they were actually in the system for six months not doing any modifications so nobody saw it it's a critically important to be able to understand the behavioral patterns of your organization in order to catch those opportunities and i'm sure dave can comment in more detail on what that behavior structure looks like and how you control it so is that to the point of uh, they're in the system six months learning gathering information, data, how communication occurs, who's involved. Absolutely. Uh, sure, so yeah, David, if you Sure, David. And, and again, to just add additional context to, to the problem um, is traditional security and fraud protection tools, if there's no modifications to data, if the criminal is, if you will, just canvassing the, the environment looking for the, the right areas that they want to, to probe on and ultimately commit a criminal act, fraud, 
if you're not changing data, traditional tools aren't going to pick up on that activity. So they can live inside the, the accounts and live inside the, the application environment undetected. Those are traditional tools. So turning then to best practices and the right way to approach this, uh, it, it really requires a, a proactive monitoring tool that can look at behavior analysis by user, by a group of users, and to determine is this typical behavior or is it atypical? And to detect fraud and criminal activity before it happens, before it occurs. That's, that's the critical next step for organizations to be able to employ these types of tools. So this is looking, uh, this is a theory of looking at anomalous behavior that precedes, you know, you're gathering information, you're doing things that aren't standard. Uh, that can predate somebody either wasting time, gathering information they shouldn't be, or committing fraud, whether it's internally driven or externally driven. Correct. Okay. So, and, it, and it's not enough just to be able to identify that activity, but it's to be able to take preventative action. So in analytics, we look at, you, you want to be able to, to, to be able to analyze data, but just handing a report, just distributing some information without action associated with that is fairly useless. The combination, the powerful combination, is to be able to identify anomalous behavior, but then have a system that automatically takes some prescriptive action, whether it's an alert or to, to block that activity uh, from happening before any type of uh, criminal activity takes place. So is this, is this sort of like uh, the antivirus of behavior, you know, behavior that's not, not standard, uh, alerting you to a potential problem or stopping it. Correct. Excellent. Right. So and just Craig, if, if I may, I, yeah. I think your comment about the antivirus is, is, is really accurate because if you look at what's happening and the uptick in sophistication of these fraudulent attempts, it is almost like a virus acting to, uh, or, or a, a, uh, an antibiotic no longer being effective on a bacterium because the bacterium has migrated to a di different form. And we see that in medicine, but we're also seeing that in this kind of a situation where as the sophistication gets raised, there's a mutation of the, of the attempt and the attempt of the structure, so it's a constant battle. It isn't something that you can do once and be able to identify it, which is why what Dave talked about with heuristic capabilities in the behavior monitoring that allow you to understand anomalies in the, in the behavior and actually take action against those anomalies are critical. That's excellent. So I think we'll also, maybe next year at this session, we'll, we'll not only have a FinTech hot seat, we might have a FinTech Petri dish. <laughs> Just to use that idea of the, the mutating virus and how you have to continue to uh, increase your defenses. So uh, yeah, so let's step over this, the security framework because I want to explore a couple topics on this. So uh, this is just a, a picture, a visual image of how an organization uh, has certain areas that they need to cover. What's the overall framework? How do you position yourself in a muscular way, in a strongly defensive way, to address different areas? So on the right-hand side, you have third-party elements like banks, treasury providers, payment hubs, et cetera, where your data and your information and processing is stored outside the organization. There's a transport element. We're moving data back and forth, whether it's just information, or enacting certain types of transactions. Then we have the inside of the organization as well as people, et cetera. But the organization, there's a perimeter, everything from the firewall, uh, antivirus uh, management, down to the interior. The interior could be what people do in processes, in systems. The interior could be where data is stored in an unencrypted fashion or who has access to it. There's a whole range of what's done on the desktop, what can be changed. So all those things when you talk about a monitoring behavior and analyzing it kind of fall into either the, from the perimeter on into the interior. There's a lot of items here to talk about in terms of people, et cetera. But for this discussion, for this hot seat, we're really focused on the interior here in terms of that element of control. So if we're looking at interior, what do we need to think about? What should be our guiding thoughts about how we manage and control the interior? You mentioned something about monitoring. So maybe you guys could explore what that means, what we should think about. Sure. So. The, when we work with organizations and, and have discussions again with treasury teams and then also subsequently security teams, so much emphasis is on protecting the perimeter. So much emphasis is on preventing any type of perimeter breach um, and external parties associated with that. And, and rightly so, that, that absolutely has to be shored up. 
but we like to use the, the castle analogy, which is to say that if the perimeter is breached, and, and worse, if you have someone on the inside who has access to whatever you're trying to protect, that also has to be focused upon. So the point would be is that at least one third of when, when the root cause analysis is done on fraudulent activity, at least one third of fraudulent activity is based on someone who is on the inside who had access to that privileged information. And it may not be, it may not be a malicious act on the part of that employee or contractor or whomever they are. It may be that their credentials were compromised through malware or some other method. So the point would be that you have to protect yourself from external parties, but you also have to protect yourself from folks who have access internally to that information. So does that, so that you know, external folks can, if they breach the wall, they might appear to be an internal party, right? They have the credentials, they've Correct. stolen it. Okay. Now they're operating in this, protect, they're inside the wall, you know, like a spy or whatever, operating in a way that's, uh, you know, that, that's a, maybe anomalous, but also uh, certainly with uh, bad intentions. That's right. Yeah, and I think it's important also to recognize that the third party, as you mentioned, is not just your firewalls and your, the other parts of your own controlled infrastructure. It also represents the level of security that exists amongst those people with whom you're doing business. Nobody operates internally only anymore. Everybody's got partners, whether it's a network communication solution such as Swift, whether it's your bank, whether it, whoever it is, there is connectivity and each one of those connections represents a potential risk and has to be controlled. And what that means is that the multiple layers of the security environment all have to be taken into consideration and all have to be implemented. But most importantly, if you do all of those things, but somebody, as you said, gets a password, a user number and a password, it isn't enough. You have to have that ability to know what your employees or apparent employees are doing and be able to understand anomalous behavior. Why is somebody looking at accounts for the European division when their job is in the United States? Why is somebody looking at the record of an employee that isn't part of their mission? So all of those things have to be taken into consideration. You can only go so far on the perimeter. The real protection is on the internal part. So, so just want, I, I want to exp we want to explore that a little more, but uh, one, one question that came to mind when you were talking about that is, you think about data stored in different places, there might be a policy that says, hey, this data or that data, uh, only certain people have access to it. That's a written policy, it's in a piece of paper. That, that written piece of paper has no predictive, no power at all. It's just that's what it's supposed to be. And reality may be very different from that. In fact, it's almost always different from what's written or understood. So this idea of monitoring, maybe system monitoring of activities of behaviors and policies, it's actionable. How does that change the landscape of this defensive posture? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it seems like it would be dramatic because now it's the policy is enforced systematically. It's monitoring. Something's going up as a, you know, only one person in IT was supposed to have access to this particular drive. Now it sees that there's four people accessing it or something like that. What are, what are some of the elements? How does that help? organizations with their defense? Well, the reality is that basically what you're looking for is actionable intelligence. Information flow without activity associated with the information is meaningless. So one of the things that is critical is the ability to be able to take what is apparently disparate factors into account and be able to collate them in a way that identifies activities that may be legitimate here and may be legitimate here but the two of them occurring simultaneously or in close approximation is not legitimate. And that kind of heuristic learning is something that is critical to the internal monitoring process. Okay, so, so just a question on that. So what are, I get the theory of that, but what would, be, what would be an example or two of how those disparate behaviors get linked together, let's say with a system look, that can show and say, this is, you know, right, they're looking at the wrong type of data. They don't have access to that data. That might be an example. But what are some other elements where pulling this disparate data together, you know, finding out some kind of linkage and saying this is anomalous? What might be an example of that that we don't think about? You know, you can't have somebody looking and watching all the, the activities. You have systems doing it. So what are some examples? Sure. So, again, one, I'll 
give you where some organizations struggle and where the technology is now at a point that, that it can really help. And that is um, gaining, organizations really struggle, again, with these disparate data sets and those who have access to that data, of gaining a holistic view, a 360 degree view of the activity and potential threats within their organization. And so the technology is at the point now uh, with the consolidation of, of alerts and analysis on user behavior of, of combining it, regardless of what tool is setting off the alert or providing that information, combining it all into one place, and you use the term, it's really link analysis of being able to stack these, these sequence of activities associated with a user, for instance, or an account, or some other criteria, and then we, we call it risk scoring. So then once you know, there's a, a certain amount of risk and therefore a number attached to that. If it eclipses a threshold in terms of a risk score, it's deemed to be truly a threat within the organization that requires an investigator or a fraud analyst or someone else within the organization to take a hard look at what's going on. But again, it's really independent of where the activity is coming from. It's all centralized and then it's provided a risk score so that the organization can really understand on a holistic view of what's happening. So this whole calibration of uh, these different factors uh, allow you to focus on the, the most items that are red and then yellow and uh, right. certain ones will trigger a shut off or you know, a stop order versus something else. Excellent. Exactly. Yep. So what else, what else do we need to be thinking about in terms of uh, risk management on the interior? Any other key thoughts that we should be thinking or, or planning for? I think that the assumption has to be that there is no point in time where this is done. And I think that's the message that I would deliver the most is it's never going to be done. There's always going to be another attempt. There's always going to be another variation. There's always going to be a smarter virus. There's always going to be something out there. So it requires what David talked about in terms of recognizing the threat, stopping them up across the entire infrastructure as well as the, the internal fraud issue, but also collating. And that's the biggest thing, I think. I think there's the recognition that it's never going to end and that you must be able to collate multiple happenstances into a vision of what's going on and be able to react to that. I, I think that's excellent and um, you know that idea that uh, crime does pay, that the, the risk level has increased, the payout for criminals has gone, it says the defensive posture has to increase. And it's not, it's increased in your set. It's an ongoing process of staying ahead, increasing the walls and the defensive, with, defensive posture within the walls, what needs to be done, how do you monitor and stop that quickly. So we will have time for a question or two, but I wanted to thank everyone for coming. Thank you, Dave and David. Appreciate thank it. you, Craig. Thanks, Craig. Appreciate the opportunity.